Hi guys, my name is Ian. I'm an alcoholic. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, today has been like the last 10 days, I guess, but unmanageable. Uh, yeah, total contrast to when I was sharing a year, year ago. On that day, I got here at half past eight because I was so anxious. I forgot the time. I was outside here alone. And this year, I'm like late. And you know, uh, it's life on life's terms. I'm still getting used to it. And these last 10 days have uh, shown me how how out of depth, out of my depth I can be and how God's always in control. So, uh, like most people, you know, this, this part of the year is quite uh, strenuous. And uh, I've had a lot of reference points to, you know, uh, try and make it better than the first uh, December period that I encountered in my first year. But it was totally different. But yeah, it's not about that. It's, from a two-year milestone and uh, the two years have been each year has been massive growth in my not not only for me but for the people that I share my life with my friends family people I live with you know my girlfriend my mom and yeah so uh, that's what I'd like to share about you know what it was like which was a lot of uh, selfishness self-centeredness destruction and uh, what it's like now which is uh, less of all those things, but a lot of the positives, like, you know, patience, love, care. So yeah, I'll just uh, share a word about, I grew up, I was the last born. I, uh, I have, my parents got married, I think, like when they in the early 20s, and my elder sister, my, my only sister was born. And my brother, they all live in Cape Town, and my brother was born, they all moved to Durban. I grew up in Newlands West. I was born in uh, 1982, it's 11 years after my sister and 9 years after my brother. And uh, yeah, so like, I grew up in a household that uh, a lot, a lot of love that I received. And uh, it was quite, uh, like, my dad is like me and uh, I became like him. Like how, when he was at his worst, I had reached that state, at, at, you know, at the end of my, <laughs> thankfully at the end of my, uh, drinking and yeah so we grew up with a lot of uh, uncertainty and I can understand that it's funny because I could understand it in my step five uh, mentally and I could like uh, I still couldn't I thought I understood it and in my first year of trying to process it all and, and being around my father and trying to make amends and trying to understand him I uh, found that I couldn't understand it because like I should judge him and stuff, and now I understand it way more better this year. So uh, yeah, so we grew up like a lot of stuff like I can relate to of making the home uh, really unstable, so projecting how I feel. Like I grew up in a world where my father projected how he felt. So if he was sad, we were sad. If he was happy, we were happy. And there was a lot of control, the same stuff that I would end up doing, you know, in my adult life. So. My mom always was our rock, and then my sister, as far as I can remember. Like, uh, my earliest memories of my sister starting to take care of me was I must have been about four. My grandmother had passed away, and my mom had gone to Beria in Northern Cape, and my sister and I spent like a few weeks together. And that's when a, a real bond between us started, and she's been there for me ever since, like, like a mom to me. And I've always been protective, I've always been loved, and uh, I've never had many consequences. I've had my, most of my consequences before the last years of my drinking, I stopped drinking at 37, and uh, most of my consequences were all internal. Like, I would just make my, beat myself up and feel like, you know, bad. I was always rescued by my family, like at any, any time, given all the opportunities that they could give me. And yeah, so my childhood was a lot of uh, fun and a lot of happiness, a lot of love, and uh, we were quite a strong family. Like, whatever happened, we got through it together. And thinking about, I've heard a lot of shares, and I've met a lot of friends, and people have lost people, and my girlfriend's lost her dad, and people have lost family members, and I've been blessed. I've never lost anyone close to me, not a sibling or even a close, someone really close. I've never experienced that loss. So, uh, but whatever else we experience as a family, we, we always stuck together and we got through it. So, I uh, matriculated in 2000. I didn't want to study. I remember. Uh, there's so much of stuff that happened from the time I was 18 till about 30. 
that I can put it in one box because I lived the same life for like maybe even until I was 33, I lived the exact same life for 15 years of just drinking, going out to clubs, going out to parties. Everything was the same. Everything changed around me, but I remained the same, the exact same person. I woke up thinking the same. I woke up wanting to do the same things. I, I never changed at all. So uh, my, I started working and the next year my uh, family convinced me to go and study. I enrolled when I was 19, I enrolled to study law. My brother's a lawyer and they thought that would be a good idea. And I was quite interested because I wanted to be like him. He's always been my role model and I want to be like, you know, like now for different reasons and before for different reasons. So uh, yeah, I went to study law and I remember doing the first few exams and studying and we should have family dinners, like we should go out like for certain people's for birthdays and stuff. And I remember one day sitting at a table with him and uh, talking about the stuff that I'd learned in the exam that I wrote and the things I knew. And I remember him being blown away and like, hey, you know all that. And I felt like the sense of accomplishment, the sense of, oh, like, you know, I've reached it. It was the first semester. And somehow I felt so completed that I didn't even care to do it again after that. The next semester I didn't even go and write the exams. Uh, I stopped studying, he gave me a job, I started working for him, which would be for the next 10 years at that point, I didn't know for a, but during that period, again, they told me to go and study. I missed one hour, also my dad enrolled me to go study BCom at Natal University, same thing I did, I enrolled, registered, uh, I remember there, felt like a really small fish in a big pond. In high school, I was like, you know, I had all the cool friends, we did all the wrong stuff and you know we were like those guys that could walk around and get whatever we want done and being in university I uh, I felt really meaningless, I felt inferior which I wouldn't know obviously until now that you know it's the nature of my disease that I am I am, I do, I have a you know I feel inferior, I feel like and it's not because uh, people make me feel that way it's like I haven't accomplished stuff, I didn't you know and uh yeah, I remember that was, I should drink. I used to go to campus with a lip of uh, brandy and I'll go for the morning lectures and at about 10, 11, go to the cafeteria to play pool. But just to put my tour hand down, I should be so nervous that I will put it down and go to the toilet, pour myself a drink and come out and then I, and I'll spend the rest of the day there. And the same thing happened there. I flunked out of university there and went back to my brother and worked. I think I must have been about 24, 25 where they convinced me to do uh, law again through UNISA and work. So everything was set up for me. There was a, a law practice that I could go into. My dad worked there, my brother, it was his, and I registered and the dream was there, but always the easier, softer way. So that was like, you know, my life then. And uh, yeah, always about fun. I think I never, there was never a moment that I didn't have any fun. So fast forward like to, uh, maybe 2014, from 2010 to 2014, my drinking did get way worse in the sense that I wanted to do everything that I could do. All the festivals, all the outdoor events, all the music things, all the beer festivals, all everything I could do. I was doing, I was doing stuff every weekend, every month, there was some kind of new thing, you know, with social media, always being on social media, always showing the life I had and the amounts of concerts I was going to or like the, like things like Splashy Fan and whatever there were things, things that didn't even interest me. Didn't like the music, but I just wanted to go there to get drunk and be a part of and put it on social media. And then uh, I, in 2015, I was drinking like a lot, a lot, a lot. Like I should drink almost every day and uh, always blackouts. I should drink from a Thursday to a Monday. I never worked on a Monday for about three years. I was working for my brother and I should make a joke about it. Like I don't work on Mondays and I'll leave on Friday at like one. And uh, that was my life. My life was always an easier, softer way, no consequences. No one's getting upset with me. Parents were never, everyone always coddled me and I took full advantage of it. 2015, I got really sick in November, started losing weight. And uh, I went to the hospital and they had gram tests and stuff and they found out that I had lymphoma, phasone lymphoma, which is a form of cancer and uh, I had to undergo chemotherapy. And uh, by that time, like with my drinking and my father's drinking and my mom had just, uh, her Alzheimer's had just started showing up in 2015. Our, our family unit was like probably the worst it had ever been. Uh, 
my sister had also before they had gone through a divorce, but she had got back to her, with her husband. They had gone to Mozambique. Our family was some weird stuff was happening where we all were just acting out prior to that. And then when I got diagnosed for cancer and I started doing my chemo, uh, our family came close again. I remember being a, a, a really good thing because I'm really, I, I love family and I love the whole family unit. I feel safe. I feel like, uh, but it's all my selfishness because it's like, if my family is happy, then I can do what I want basically. I don't, and they make themselves happy on their own. I don't really contribute to it. So everybody got close at that time again. And uh, every Sunday before I, go, I should go to the hospital for a whole week of, and I'll stay there. But every Sunday, we'd all meet up and have lunch and spend time and talk. And it was like, up to now, I think it's the last time we all ever did that. It was those Sundays and it was six Sundays every three weeks. And I, I got, and you know, uh, I like this reading, like uh, yesterday's reading. The last meeting that I went to was last week, Monday. I've been working uh, quite a lot and uh, my connection to God hasn't been there as much as it's always been. And I've been really blessed and sometimes fortunate that, you know, this fellowship is somewhere I can always come in and uh, refuel or, or reconnect to God. And I've always go to, I've been like going to like four or five meetings a week. So I never felt what it's like to go for two meetings a week in a long time. I think I've only done that once. Uh, and that was the beginning of this year, last year. And uh, yeah, so I went to Monday's meeting and the topic, the, the big book topic the guy chose was uh, January 1st, I am a miracle. And I liked that reading and uh, I sat there and I reflected on like, you know, not only the last few years of my life and the reading was like uh, how God's always been there. And uh, in my life, God's always been there for me. And I had lost him the last two years of my drinking. And I uh, got to reflect, so uh, why I mentioned the God part is like when I uh, got diagnosed, I, I prayed in the bed and I said like, you know, like whatever happens, happens, it's like that will be done. I grew up uh, with a lot of faith in my home. My mother's, my mother's a very faithful person, like, you know, with our religion and stuff. And she's always uh, kept me safe and she has the ability to always keep me, make me feel strong, make me feel positive. And uh, I still, I, I have that then. And everything worked out for me, and I was really grateful. I thought I was really grateful that I had, you know, that my family didn't have to have that worry anymore because by April I had finished, 2016 April, I had finished chemo, I had started radiation in that August, and I had finished it by the end of that year, and I was perfectly fine. By that November, I was like a normal person. My hair had grown back, I was healthy, I put on weight, I was healthy as I'd looked in like a few years' time, and I started drinking a lot after that. I started drinking because I had like this uh, recklessness about no one knows what I've been through. Uh, y'all can't tell me anything. And I saw my family backing off, which they had done that year. That put me first that entire 2016 and I took full advantage of it. 2017, I went back to work with my brother. And uh, not long after that, my mom's Alzheimer's was like really bad where uh, she couldn't remember much and she couldn't complete her. She couldn't make a cup of tea and stuff. So I. I used that as one of my crutches to start drinking and to complain about how bad my life is because I had lost my, the stuff that I had for 2016. And uh, my brother had gotten so fed up with me at work, being so negative and uh, stuff. Something I, I wasn't used to being like this negative and this bitter person. And he had told me I'd rather stay at home and he had paid me my salary. And I remember when he told me that I was in my office and I just closed the file and I said, thank you very much. I hope you keep up to your word and I went home. And he paid me my salary and I started drinking at 12 every day while I was just I was still in Durban because I didn't have any responsibilities. In, my fighting with my dad got more bad because I was drinking a lot, drinking more. And every time I got drunk and every time I needed to vent or project, I could hear my easy target. I could call him a bad father. I could tell him, call him out and how you treated my mom, how you treated me, how you treated my siblings. It's not something I'm proud of, but you know, it's like I felt justified in me not seeing that I'm treating him worse than what he had done to us. And uh, I, I moved to the South Coast to Pennington, in fact, in 2018. And I was happy. I thought I had, you know, I'd left all my madness behind and uh, it had followed me. I drank for about six months normal and then the, the problem starts. And this time now, all the consequences were at the feet of my girlfriend, like, you know, by, by the end of that year, I'd stopped paying my credit card, I'd stopped paying my debits. I, had, I wasn't interested in the rent, the, the burden all fell on her. I just 
just drank and drank and the consequences and my behavior and harming people got more and more and more. And the only people that were on the South Coast were my in-laws. So everything was, now I was like, uh, my, my people back home, like all my friends and family in Durban had not known anything about all this. But the people like uh, my in-laws and stuff, they had seen the branch of it. During that period, I had, uh, I had got drunk one day and swore like uh, my sister-in-law and some of the cousins that were there at this party, like really bad. And I found out that uh, Mandy's dad was really upset with me and I avoided him. He stayed like in uh, Park Lane, which is like 10 kilometers from here where I stayed. And I managed to avoid him for an entire year. I never go to see him. I never, I, I gone only on the Christmas a year later. And when I went in, I apologized to him and he said, forget about it. You know, so there was a lot of times like I, I have, was that almost my, and that wasn't enough. That was now in 2018. So 2019, I, my mom came to live with us. And uh, I had this, another chip on my shoulder that, you know, I'm, I'm this good son that's taking care of my mom, man. You know, and then my, uh, my brother used to send money to me. And I used to use that for my mom and use it the rest on alcohol. And again, the wheels started coming off. I had started taking loans from my brother, to having these ideas of doing this and doing that. And I, I had made sure that door was shut where I would not get any more financial help. I carried on drinking. Again, I started attacking, you know, like the people at home. And eventually, uh, my dog Watson came in that November, but the run-up was October. For my birthday, my brother uh, asked me what I want to do, and I said I would like to go to to guys with your Ruby Gorge. I'd like to go to a Ruby Gorge and stay there, and you know, just clear my mind. I had like this dream that I could be this spiritual, peaceful person, and all I had to do was be in nature my own way. And uh, what I did with that, he had sent me the money to go to have this weekend away. And I drank the entire weekend with that money, and I don't even remember, I was in blackout. And from that, I, I become so bitter and resentful with everyone around me. I was in debt, my family was upset with me, my in-laws were upset with me, and all I could do was just be bitter and resentful. And, uh, yeah. So I finally got into rehab after a whole week of drinking and in blackout. It was Andy's birthday, and I had spoiled that day, and I had spoiled the day after that, and eventually, uh, the day before I went to rehab, I was at home. I was, I, I don't know if it was psychosis or not, but I, had, I was just bursting out in aggressive screaming. I wake up at two in the morning, I'll be in my room alone and I'll be swearing and stuff. And uh, my mother basically came and told me that she never raised, uh, raised me to be this kind of person. And uh, it's the first time she's ever told me something, called me out on my behavior. And she told me she never raised me to be this person and uh, she never leave my father to come and experience the same, to be with someone exactly like him. And that was, that for me was my emotional rock bottom and the next day I went into treatment. And like the, today's reading says about the foundation, I'm like, sure, you know, like, I sit in awe, like when I, when I was sitting in Monday's meeting and reflecting on the year, I still sit in awe of everything that I experienced for those three months. It was like, from, from the time I walked in, I experienced God. Within a week, I was I found my connection to my higher power. It was it was just amazing. Like you know that uh, with my religion and uh, the stuff that I learned growing up that I'd forgotten about. I would go for Sunday school classes. I would go for camps. I would go for everything. I would hear it, but it would go out of my ear. And then to be in a place where the, it's, in some ways the similarities are right there, but now the action is needed. And it was like only after about ten days, like. When my meds, like I was uh, detoxing for a week, and I, had, within ten days, I was fully committed. I was like, I walked into my sponsor's office, and I was like, I need, you know, I, I want to stay. I want to talk to my family, and God's, God's been there for me. It's been a really amazing journey. You know, I, uh, I had a Thursday call, and I called uh, Mandy, and I said, you know what, I, uh, I need to ask you something. Is it okay that I stay here? And uh, she said yes. And she says, uh, I said, can I? Can you ask my family if they, you know, if they could pay for me? And she said, I've already done that. And your brother said, yes. And I remember that was like a really big moment for me. I didn't know that, you know, I was sitting, and I, I still sat in a lot of guilt and shame for a long time. Because I, I'm like my number one punisher when it comes to me doing something wrong. And uh, yeah, my journey at that treatment was nothing short of, of amazing. I got to see so many miracles happen. Like, you know, I... I she had like on every Sunday I saw miracles and I saw families getting together. I saw parents and children reuniting. 
I've just, it was a really beautiful time for me. And uh, I couldn't wait to get back out. I couldn't wait to, to get out and share and, you know, do things the right way and stuff. And uh, I got to connect to, like, you know, in my life story, I got to connect to the selfishness that uh, how I really, like, how I got off this high of I'm taking care of my mother and a friend showed me my reality that nobody can take care of their mother if they're drinking all day, you know. You're taking a box of making a meal and giving meds, but that's not true love. That's not care. And I couldn't believe that for a whole year, I felt good that I was like, you know, I was this good son. So I learned a lot while I was in treatments and, you know, I'm happy God led me to that. It might have been, a, my goal until it might have been me moving to the South Coast, being closer, because that's all I wanted. I was said that I'll go to Rehab, but I want to go to the closest one. And that's the one that came up. And uh, after treatment, I got home. I mean, really, I was blessed. I mean, I have a friend that I that I met there, a good few friends, and one I live with still, he lives next door to me. And we always spoke about how we're gonna, when we leave treatment, he lives in Amzinto and I lived in uh, Paynton, and we will always be close. And we didn't know we'd be that close, and you know, he lives next to me. So a lot of things that have happened in the last two years, from the time this journey started, has been, uh, like, to say, like today's reading, has been a foundation for me to just propel, and then obviously that's, everything's been like, you know, God's plan. Like even today, my mom's caregiver was supposed to be uh, early and I didn't really want to bring her and uh, obviously God's plan again. And I've, I've started to, you know, accept that, uh, that I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm like this really small person and God's the, the, the leading force because whenever I accept God's will, it's mad because I've, I've learned this two years ago, but I still, my self-will is still probably the most strongest thing in me. And uh, when I'm in self-will, I, I don't say anything. It's all my defects, my anger, my aggression, put myself on a pedestal, my judgment. It's all there in full force. And when I'm in God's world, I fear self world. When I live in God's world, the thing that I don't want the most is to be in self world, you know, to, to be in control of my life. It's so much easier when God's in control, but I always take control back. So yeah, like last year, I got out of treatments and the lockdown started within two weeks. I didn't find it too hard because there were so many Zoom me meetings set up really quick and I got to do many meetings and I got to reconnect with all my friends that were had gone all over. I got to get onto meetings in Cape Town with my Cape Town friends, people that went to Hillcrest and the Zoom thing kicked off and it was good because we started using even the WhatsApp group stuff more and uh, the calls and things and we joined meetings and it was really good for me that uh, my first year but all I had to do was stay sober and uh, I did that. And I sat here and I was very grateful. I remember last uh, year, my first year, being really, really grateful, feeling like I had accomplished so much. And all I had accomplished was staying sober and uh, I, I put the brakes on harming people close to me. I never really started, I, I wasn't working. I was, I was still in debt, but still behind on rent. The real life stuff wasn't being taken care of, but I felt good. And I guess that's also, which I got to find out that's not working a good program, you know, that's just, me feeling good is not the goal. I mean, I have to be doing good. So I was blessed, like, uh, my, all, all my family relationships were, were good by the time I had left treatment. Everybody still cared about me. My family really, like, you know, they have always put me first. Things have changed with my brother, where uh, I've always been the one that needed his help. He's always been bearing me out. That's been the relationship our entire life. But now we're, like, uh, more on a equal step in and that's also due to me not asking him to bail me out anymore whether it's it's only been financially or if i got into trouble and i haven't been getting into trouble with the law or with any people or any civil things so i've never had the reason to be bailed out financially i've been with his help i've been able to steady the boat like uh, at, by the end of my first year my brother had bought us house so beginning of 2021 we moved to scottborough and the terms that we agreed on, it was quite good. And, but I had to still find money somewhere. And I was blessed. A guy in the fellowship sent me a message and said, you have a, in March last year, says you have an interview, go and see this person at, uh, at Enzo's and uh, tell them, I've already spoken for you and you just go there. And I told him that you're a hard worker. I don't know, I don't know if he was lying or what. But I went there and I got the job as, uh, to train as a waiter, which I was fearful of because it's crazy because prior to that, I was acting on South, South Pole again. I had this dream of opening up a shop in Scottborough and uh, this easy way out, selling like 
ice creams and confectionery and I'll get this business loan from my brother. Everything again, everything again. <coughs> Never discussed with my sponsor. I was uh, getting quotes for deep freezers. I already found a place where how much it was to rent. I already asked my brother for the loan and that's when my friend sends me the thing to go. And to be honest, the first time I went to go see the, the manager at that restaurant, I only did it so my friend couldn't say, you never went. So when I got there, I uh, trained. I didn't like it. I didn't like talking to people. I didn't like facing people. I didn't want to, I, I felt overwhelmed. And uh, by the first week, I was just clearing stuff. I enjoyed just clearing things so I didn't have to talk to anyone. And uh, the manager said, okay, right, if you want to be a waiter here, you have to be able to talk to people. Every shift, you have to go and talk to everyone at each table and ask them how was their meals. And I said, okay, there must be another way. Then he said, okay, at least talk to your table. And you know, uh, I put in the action and I, uh, and now I enjoy, I enjoy, it's been nine months later, I enjoy being a waiter, I enjoy how, you know, serving people. I enjoy making their days, family's days special, going the extra mile. I like, you know, I enjoy all that. And I've been able to pay all my bills. The money I've made there has helped me furnish my home, has helped me pay bills. I've never been in the red in this past year. It's all, like, I've, I've become self-sustainable, something I've never been my entire life. I mean, I turned 39 last year, so I was 38, and it was the first time I could pay bills. I never, I never needed to be bailed out. I could pay for the landscaping, pay for the pool. Groceries were fine. Things broke, I replaced it. I even did maintenance, you know, I bought tools. It's like stuff I've never done. The amount of stuff I did last year, being, I don't want to sound like, you know, like a man or a person, but just being a, a normal functioning person, the amount of stuff I did, um, it's, it's not, it's, it's been a blessing. You know, all I've done is follow this program, the stuff I've learned from day one, and follow like what people share. And uh, it's normal things, it's normal stuff. And I've, I've, like when I sit at home, I have a home now, something that I can say that, uh, you know, my, my girlfriend and I built together and it's, it's, it's really mad, it's mad because in 2019, I was living in a small flat, I was in debt, I was had issues with the landlord, I couldn't afford the rent, we were like getting bailed out, I was borrowing money and you know, and, and to have this kind of life now, it's, it was so far, it's so far-fetched. It's still like, if I sit down and I have to look around me and count my blessings, there's so many blessings that have happened in the past year. There's so many, there's so much of uh, things around me and uh, the amount of friends I have. I, I thought that, you know, I was so blessed to have just the friends <coughs> that I met in rehab. And then every year I meet more and more, I get more and more new relationships, more friends, more people that help me, more people that care about me. It's just been, there's so much that has happened in this past year. My second year of recovery has been like, uh, it feels like so close to the life I had when maybe like in 2010, when I was like, I won't say uh, popular or like fully in a void, but like in 2010, I remember going to like the World Cup and taking all my, taking friends for each game and being like, you know, that's what I thought was uh, having good relationships and being cared for and helping people. That's what I thought, like, you know, it would be like, uh, that was my life. If I can entertain people and if people can entertain me, then, you know, that that's a good life. And now it's a total opposite, you know, it's like, I care about everyone that comes, I, I can have people over and I care genuinely about everyone. People have me over and there's such a common bond. There's never been a relationship that I've had with friends and uh, people in this fellowship where it's been nothing but mutualism. You know, people have done more for me than I've done for them. And uh, that's been my journey in my second year. My second year is that I've become uh, more of a functioning person in society. I've been able to take care of myself and take care of, like genuinely take care of my mom. I mean, this morning, the last minute notice, we've got already got everything done. You know, like I get my mother's medication every month, like appointments are set. And it, it doesn't feel like, I, I don't even feel egotistical about it. It's not something that I write down and say, this is a chore. It's something that I'm supposed to do and not something that I'm supposed to just like uh, feel good about. In fact, everything that I've done in this last year, it's, it's normal. And just followed the program, followed my sponsor's suggestions, followed everything that's been set out for me. Nothing's been special. I've never put in, I've never done anything special besides follow this program that what people wrote back in 1930, somewhat. Something that they had written then, I've just tried to follow to the best of my ability and God's 
bless me. God bless me so much. I have good health. I have good relationships. I have a good home. I have a good job. And yeah, I'm healthy. And I'm really grateful that uh, I'm here to, I've, I've been given two chances in life. One was God uh, helped me get through cancer. I'm cancer free for like over five years now. And I'm sober for two years, which is my biggest accomplishment yet. Thanks for your mission. Thanks, Aaron. Yeah.